Welcome to the award-winning Dare to Dream podcast with Debbie Dashner, covering metaphysics, ETs, shamanism, and channeling. Here you will find spiritual inspiration from today's thought leaders, along with cutting-edge insights from our interstellar brothers and sisters and ancient shamanic wisdom. Now, here's a new episode of Dare to Dream with your host, Debbie Dashinger. Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. Hey, beautiful people. Today I'm talking to Dan Hare. Hare. It rhymes with Ferrari. And he's a longtime UFO researcher. And Dan has experienced three UFO sightings during his life. This show, Dare to Dream, has won three Talk Radio Positive Change Awards, won the COVR Award for Best Radio and Podcast Show, Walt Magazine named Dare to Dream, one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to, and it is high ranking under self-improvement in Apple Podcasts. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. They do beautiful energy work out in the world. You can join them at drdanehere.com. I want to say if you are on YouTube, youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger, then you can find we have all brand new Dare to Dream merch. It is so cool. I've been actually ordering myself shirts, pet t-shirts, coffee cups, et cetera. They're available to you. And also membership is now available for you to sign up. Highly recommended because we're going to be doing some private lives there with the guests coming up, things that nobody else can hear and questions you get to ask. I'm Debbie Dashinger. I'm a book writing coach, media visibility expert. I work with you so that you finish and write your book. I also take books to a guaranteed international best-selling status. And finally, I do some publicity work for folks who want to get booked on radio and podcasts. I have something very special opening. I've not never done this before. So this is one of those, if you want to, don't sit on this. If you want to, check it out and register. I am offering a five-day book writing challenge where every day for five days straight, you get to work with me, Debbie, directly live. This is where you get to discover how to tell your inspiring story, share your expert knowledge or professional expertise, maybe leave your legacy by joining the five-day book writing challenge. You must register. Go to debbied.net slash book challenge. It will be in the notes, show notes. It's d-e-b-b-i-d.net slash book challenge. During these five days, we are going to dive deep into that book that you want to write. So maybe there's a book that you want to write, but you just don't know where to start. Or maybe you started writing a book and you got stuck along the way. Or you've been working on that book for years and you just haven't made the progress you had hoped. Or maybe you're just not clear on your book idea. So let me help you during the challenge. You're going to receive all these live sessions with me so we can uncover that book inside of you. These writing assignments, the teachings, the resources are going to help you complete your book. And hey, you get access to me live for guidance, accountability, and support. And as a bonus, when you register, you're going to get a copy, phenomenal guide called Write Your Book in 60 Days. Again, you want to go to debbyd.net slash book challenge, D-E-B-B-I D dot net slash book challenge. My guest today is the author of several books, including My Paranormal Life, Dan Hari. Hari is an entertainment industry publicist, UFO experiencer author, and chairman of the Hollywood Disclosure Alliance. Dan is host of the weekly podcast, Live from Hollywood, It's Paranormal Tonight. Dan's other books are Flirting with Fame, Carrots, and After They Came. You can learn more about him at danharryauthor.com. And with that, I welcome the amazing Dan to Dear to Dream, it is so great to have you on the show. Hi, Debbie. Thank you very much. By the way, it's Harari. Harari. Har- like, huh, like, huh, Harari. It's, <laughs> that's how I remember. It's like rhymes with Ferrari, and that's how I remember it. But Dan Harari, just for the record. 
Thank you. I appreciate that so much, Dan sure. Harari. There Welcome to the show. Uh, thank you very much for having me. It's very, it's very cool. Yeah. So that is amazing. 2023, you conceive of the Hollywood Disclosure Alliance. You serve as its chairman. So tell me the reason. Why did you and Stephen Bassett get together? How did you even come up with this? And what is the mission of the alliance? Okay. So uh, again, thank, thank you for having me. Last March 1st, my book, After They Came, was, pu was published. It was released on Amazon March 1st last year. And it's a it's a science fiction book about benevolent aliens who come to Earth to save mankind. OK. And it was inspired by a divine. Uh, I, I was given the book uh, and that's a whole story that we can do later. But I was given this book from above, I believe, from my father, from heaven. My dead father gave me this book from three days after he died. He gave this book to me. Wow. So anyway, it came. Uh, it was published last March. I went to Alien Con last March, Pasadena, the first weekend. In March, I met Eric Von Daniken, I met Georgia Tsoukalos, Nick Pope, uh, Paul Hynek, David Childress, William Henry, Jeremy Corbell, George Knapp. I met so many people. And I gifted them my book, and it was great promotion. Two weeks later, last March, middle of March 2023, I went to a little, a little a, a event in San Francisco called UFO Con. It's a little baby alien con, right? And my brother met me there because he lives in Monterey. And uh, I was selling my book there. And during that weekend, Stephen Bassett, who has been, who's a 30 year, for those who might not know who he is, he's based in Washington, D.C. He's a 30 year disclosure advocate. He was the very first disclosure lobbyist for Washington, D.C. His mission and goal in life, Debbie, as you know, is to have the president of the United States go on TV and say, ladies and gentlemen, we have something to tell you. It's been a long time. We've been hiding this a long time. We know all about extraterrestrials visiting Earth. They've been here for a long time. And uh, we had to keep it as a national security, top secret. But we felt now is the time to tell you this information. That's called disclosure with a capital D. The, Stephen calls it capital D disclosure. So he, Stephen gave a 90-minute talk. Last March, UFO Con, San Francisco. And my brother and I were like fascinated. We're like, wow. You know, now I knew who he was because I watch a million UFO documentaries and I watch Ancient Aliens. So I knew who he was. I had not met him. And he gave a talk and it was brilliant. After the talk, he was eating a dinner in the dining room there in the hotel with some friends of his. My brother and I were eating dinner there by ourselves. And, uh, I said, you know, I want to go give Stephen my book. So I gave Stephen a copy of my book after they came as a gift. I said, Stephen, I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, here's, a, here's a gift. My name is Dan. I live in L.A. I said, if you ever come to L.A., you know, I'd love to hang out with you and have lunch. And he goes, what do you do? I said, I'm a Hollywood publicist for 40, <laughs> year, for 40 years. I know, Stephen. He loved that. Okay. So Debbie, he shot out of his chair. You're a Hollywood publicist? <laughs> I, need a, I need a Hollywood publicist. I swear to God, he literally shot. And I need that. That's what I need. He pulls out from his pants like 28 business cards <laughs> of his cards. And he went for one, but like 30 cards flew, <laughs> flew across, literally across the table. His card. See, I got his card. I gave him my card. And he goes, you know, I come to L.A. quite often. I live in Washington, D.C. I come to L.A. quite often. Mm. I said, let's have lunch. Two months later, Mar uh, May last year, two months later, May, at tail end of May, he calls me, Dan, I'm in L.A. I said, let's have lunch. So we met at Michelli's Italian restaurant mm. in Hollywood. We had a three-hour lunch there, just me and him. The place was empty. And we shared, I think we shared an any pasta cell. And he told me his life story. I told him my life story. Just, I, I'll be honest, I thought he was going to hire me to be his publicist. That's what I thought. And I'm still waiting for that. Anyway, <laughs> a year ago. Anyway, so that was May 30th. So we talk, 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 eight, eight, eight. Then he looks at me, he stares at me, he goes, Dan, you know who I am. I know who you are. What can we do together? Like, what can you and I do together? So Debbie, I went like this. I looked up at this guy. <laughs> 10 seconds, I went up like this. I look back down at Stephen. It's God is my witness. I said, we're going to create the Hollywood Disclosure Alliance. Oh, my gosh. That's where it came from. Literally wow. from this, from my, the light bulb that had gone off. And I've been doing this my whole, I've had light bulbs my whole life. Mm. My whole life. That's what my paranormal life book is. 
I don't even have a copy of the book yet. It just came out last Monday. I don't I don't have a copy of the book, but here's the cover. It's on Amazon, my paranormal. Are you going to have them book? How are you going to have those books no, available? Not in time. At- I will I, only after they came, and I will have flirting with fame a few, but I don't even have one copy yet. I sent one to my to my mother for Mother's Day. <laughs> I sent my paranormal, and, and the, it's funny, Debbie. The first page of my paranormal life says dedication, right? Dedication page to my mother Joan, who believes not one of the stories in this book, <laughs> <laughs> and she called me. What are you talking about? I believe some of your stories, not all of them, but I do believe I do believe some of them. And so that's that book. So I said Hollywood disclosure to Stephen. He goes, yes, exactly. We shook hands. OK, mm. that was May 30th. Four days later last year was contact in the desert mm-hmm. Four days later. Stephen said, Dan, why don't you come out to contact? Be my guest. I have extra room in my room. Uh, I'll introduce you around. I go, I don't want to schlep. I don't want to schlep out to Palm Springs. I go, I have, I want to hang out with my daughter and relax this weekend. He goes, no, no, no. You want to meet everybody. He goes, you yeah. got to come. You got to come. You got to come. I'll introduce you. You got to come. He said, okay. So I went to contact last year, that weekend. I, Steve, Steve Bassett, who I had just met. He and I shared a, a hotel room for two days. It was, we were like the odd couple. I mean, it's like Felix and us <laughs> in, in there. We shared a room. He introduced me to Richard Dolan and Nick Pope and, and, and Ron Janix and Carolyn Corey and Katie Page and, and, and Paul Hine. I mean, it just was endless, right? So he's introducing me. Debbie, nobody knew who I was last year. Now, mm-hmm. here's what's funny. This is a year later. I love Every, everyone knows who I am now. Everyone. And I'll get to that in a minute. But last year, nobody knew me. Zero. In that world, zero people knew me. But... We went to each of these people, Dolan, Nick Pope, um, George George Nori was the best one. Stephen is introducing me. And we were telling these people, you know, we're going to create the Hollywood Disclosure Alliance. Now, this is four days after the lunch, okay, Debbie? All we had were three words. That's all we had. We had three <laughs> words, did not have a logo, did not have a website, did not have a company, did not have a staff, did not have any money, didn't know what it was. We didn't know what it was. We uh, we had my three words, and then we nicknamed it the HDA, Hollywood Disclosure Lines, the HDA. And the acronym. Okay. Right. Well, that's, that's all we had. I told George Nori this. He grabbed my shoulder. Now, he had in- interviewed me about my book a couple of weeks earlier. He goes, Danny, not only do I want to join, he goes, I want, I want to be your very first member. George Nori, I want to be your first member. He's such Nick- a mensch. Nick Pope, oh, I definitely want to join that. Richard Dolan, oh, of course I want to join that. Every person, Paul Hynek, oh, yeah, absolutely. Everyone we asked, oh, yeah, I want to be that. I want to do that. Debbie, it's three words. It, we, we, it, I felt like a snake oil. It didn't exist. It wasn't a thing. It was three words in the ether. It was three words that sounded- but I want to say, I understand- Sounded cool. The marvel over this, because that's- <laughs> really rapid creation at the same time, because I am now a member also. Right. And I will say, as soon as I heard the title, it was a slam dunk. I resonated so deeply with who I am, what I stand for, the kind of work I do is like, these are my people. Of course, I don't, whatever they're creating, I'm in. So kudos to you. That was like really divine that you came up with that. And I love that they all lined up to say, Everybody. I'm in, I want to be a member. What did you call it? Creation something? What did you just Rapid say? Rapid creation. That's exactly what it was. I never heard that term, but you're, I love I it. I made it up, but it's, no, no, what De- it, Debbie, it's the that's energy what, of what you're describing. That's what it was. I've had, I, I, I've had rapid creation my whole life. Many, many times. That's the most recent one. I love that. I pulled those words out of the sky, literally, just pulled them out. So, so tell me your mission. What is it okay. that you and Stephen hope to achieve, offer, do? Sure. What do the members do? Sure. So I'll just finish the, the the logistics of it. So we thought of it, we were in contact pitching it. Everyone joined. After contact, Stephen and I were doing Zooms from Washington. We go, what do we do now? And we said, we got to populate this thing. He invited all of his people and he knows everybody. And I invited my friends, my clients, my peers, people I knew in Hollywood. 
he had the UAP disclosure people. He knows every single person. I knew D. Wallace. I knew some producers who did the Project Blue Book TV series. I knew an agent here in Hollywood named Sean West, who represents Richard Dolan, Travis Walton, and Nick Pope. We literally, Debbie, <clears throat> last summer, last fall, Stephen and I cut and I call it cutting and pasting. We cut and paste together 150 members. That's what we and we're looking at 200. We'll have 200 this year. We'll have 200 members. Wow. He got he got Shirley MacLaine and uh, Thomas Jane. I got D. Wallace. I got Dave Foley. Um, we're hoping to get Elijah Wood soon. Or I'm really? hoping to get. I'm hoping that yeah, I'm going to get Elijah Wood. That's easy. I know his partner. And and is that because you know he's had experience? He and uh, I got a call yesterday from his partner, Elijah Wood is a partner with a new company called SpectraVision. They're producing UFO themed content with a guy named Daniel Noah. Daniel called me yesterday and uh, I need to get, he's in the HDA. I need to get Elijah Wood into HDA. We're trying to get Dan Aykroyd in. Um, but anyway, it's, it's, it's been growing. So what do we do now? That's the question, right? Oh, so half of our, if you go to our website, hollywooddisclosurealliance.org.org, half of our membership lean toward the UAP ET uh, side, experiencers, primarily experiencers, researchers, authors and filmmakers, and uh, disclosure advocates like Steve Bassett and, and Dan, Daniel Sheehan, the, the you know. Yeah, the Sheehan. lawyer. Yeah, The lawyer, the, you know, the most famous civil rights lawyer in American history, probably. Mm -hmm. He's, I mean, they're on my board. They're on, Danny's on the board of directors. So that's that. And then the other side are the Hollywood types. And what Hollywood means in this case doesn't really mean Hollywood proper. It means filmmakers, writers, directors, producers, performers, anywhere in the world. Doesn't mean it's Warner Brothers and, and Sony Pictures. It, it means anyone who is a content creator that can get something on a screen, okay? So we call it Hollywood, right? Because like you said, the word Hollywood is so powerful. I melded power, ho Hollywood and disclosure, two disparate things, really. Hollywood's LA disclosure, the movement disclosure movements, all Washington, DC. And I'm Hollywood, Stephen Bassett's Washington. I, we literally, I took his strength, my strength, and just, I, I just cut and paste them. I glued them together. And then I put Alliance at the end. So it was HDA. I needed like an acronym. So that's how it happened. Now, what do we do? Our mission statement is to network these two disparate groups with each other so that they can share stories, experiences, things that happen to real life people uh, during their lives, extraordinary events, abductions, sightings. I know two women who are good friends of mine who were impregnated and, and their fetuses were taken by extraterrestrials, two very good friends of mine. I have a friend who is friends with the Pleiadians for 55 years. He says they're the kindest, most beautiful people on the ever he calls them the light beings he's friends with pleiadians he's a good friend of mine very successful businessman none of these people are crazy mm -hmm. these are people i know very well in real life these are not crazy these are remarkable experiencers every week debbie i get emails from all over the world hi i was i was abducted when i was seven i live in ireland Oh, I, I, I met a gray at my bar mitzvah in, <laughs> in, in Russia in 1927. Wow. I, you should see my daughter. My daughter thinks I should compile. <laughs> she goes, Dad, you should compile all the emails you've been. I get all from all over the world. Can, so, let me make a comment here, because what you're saying for me in my space is so important. OK, sure. Have you heard of gate? I don't, know, don't know what that is. Gate is something that was put together I maybe around 15 years ago. And it lasted for a while. And I know they're trying to renew it, but it just hasn't been successful. So Gate was run by John Ratz, the producer, by Jim Curry, the actor, Jim Carrey, the actor, and by uh. Eckhart Tolle. So all three of them, Eckhart Tolle, Jim Carrey, and John Ratz are best friends. So they wanted to create GATE, which stands for Global Alliance for Transformational Entertainment. Interesting. And it had, I used to do red carpet interviews for those. Right. And 
there were phenomenal who came out for these. The hope for all of us who have been in the spiritual world is to end the focus on all these movies. First of all, obviously the media that puts down UFOs and makes them yeah. seem like humans who would eat one another and you know take over and kill each other. Right. Not not what benevolent ETs have in mind. And right, exactly. right. also to create something transformational for people to sit down and watch on television and in film, really important. So their heart was completely in the right place. And it was so exciting. The problem is they were just too busy and they could never, the three of them, right? It just couldn't quite happen. Why it is very meaningful to me, Dan, to hear what you're saying is that this is now a possibility. And sometimes it's a matter of timing, right? Sometimes someone has the most beautiful idea, but the timing is not divine. But if indeed you guys can manifest some of this and actually put out really amazing entertainment and movies and books and all sorts of things for people that would transform them. That is so exciting to me to, to hear you talk about disclosure and Hollywood. And now I can feel the possibilities. Well, I love what you said. Um, I, I had never, I wonder if Steve Bassett knew about Gate. I'd love to get Jim Carrey involved. I could write to his publicist or something. I, I never pitched him. Um, if you go, all right, so... This came together last summer. I Googled celebrities, UFO aliens. There's probably 50, you know, Keanu Reeves, Miley Cyrus, Goldie Hawn, Kurt Russell. Uh, 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 um, uh, uh, there's so many. There are so many. I've, I've pitched all of them. And then, of course, Spielberg, J.J. Abrams, James Cameron, M. Night Shyamalan. I've Demi? Pitched Demi Lovato? She yes, I've tried her three times. Mm. Oh, she's too busy, can't, sorry. You know, Fran Drescher's been abducted. Fran Drescher lost a fetus. She was impregnated. Uh, I, I spoke to her uh, ancient at length. You know, uh, she's too busy, Dan. She's too, yeah, she, yeah, but she's into aliens. Yeah, she's too busy, too busy. Mm. So I've pitched all these people. I'd never pitched Jim Carrey. He would be magnificent. I'd love to have him. And again, and I'm I, I'm going to get Elijah Wood in the next two or three weeks, and he's a movie star. It's growing s steadily, slowly and surely. Um, Stephen Bassett and I call HDA a networking group. We don't sell tires. We don't sell a pizza. We lend our members. And how do we do that? We have a, a, a uh, an HDA member Slack channel. I think you're in there, actually, right? So our Slack channel is hey i have a script i'm looking for uh, uh i'm looking for real life experiencers who've met the grays or sean west the agent will say ancient aliens season 25 is now casting xyz uh, it's a very robust slack channel and that's where our our members are cross cross pollinating cross breeding okay that's where they're sharing back and forth information we had one event so far in march we would had the making of project blue book the tv series it was a live event. It was a home run. We had 70 people there. It was fan absolutely fantastic. Why did we only have one? Money. I paid for that out of my pocket. We need money. We need donations. We are a 501c3. We need donations to propel our movement forward. If you go to hollywooddisclosurealliance.org, there's a donate button. And um, the more donations we have, we can do more events. We can do more things online. We can distribute our new monthly newsletter called the wow, which I called it the wow signal, which I'm super proud of. I created the wow signal. So it's uh, in fact, that's a whole nother story. I'm going to transform that into a business in the fall. That's another story. You're the first person that knows that. Wow. So, so, <laughs> um, so it's been very interesting, very exciting at contact in the desert. We're having an HDA panel called uh, UFOs, ETs, and Higher Consciousness in the Media. And I'm moderating it with uh, Thomas Jane, Katie Page. D, uh, D Wallace was going to be there. She had a bow out. So Katie Page, Thomas Jane, Steve Bassett, Serena DC, and Michael Mazzola. They're two award-winning documentary filmmakers. And um, 
I'll be there. And folks who are interested, you know, you can go to contact in the desert. It's very easy to find. It's coming up at the end of May, a little bit into the beginning of June. It's out about 30 minutes past Palm Springs and Indian Wells, a beautiful hotel. I think it's the same hotel as last year. It's really stunning. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Yeah, really quite nice. It's such a good experience. I mean- I love going. And if you're into this stuff, it's the place to be. So yeah, Dan's going to make quite a showing there. And let me ask you this, Dan. And by the way, I'll help you with this stuff. We can stay in touch about all this. Okay. Um, I want, I'm really curious because you've alluded in the things you've written that you feel uh, your father has passed And of course, you mentioned him in the story where you felt three days after his passing, he gave you this. So you feel uh, that he was involved somehow in UFOs for, specifically for the military. What is it that gave you that inkling or feeling? What kind of proof did you find or what was said or done? Okay, great question. I'll I'll do the shorthand version, okay? Because it's a very involved story. I'm going to do a 90-minute lecture about this at Contact. In March 1970, I'm almost 14 years old. My dad picked me up after school in his car, drove me home. It's about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, March 1970. I'm almost 14, near Asbury Park, New Jersey, my hometown, suburban New Jersey. We're driving home. I look through the windshield of my father's car, And Debbie, above my father's car was a huge, huge silver V, letter V, UFO craft, letter V, shiny silver, hovering above my father's car, two, three hundred feet in the air, not moving, no propellers, no smoke, hovering. I go, Dad, look, there's a UFO. Dad, there's a UFO. Stop the car. Stop the car. Dad, there's a UFO. Stop that. I'm jumping up and down in the seat. Stops the car. We get out of the car. We walk to the front of the car. Debbie, I'm literally, I'm, Dad, look, isn't this cool? Dad, is this the greatest thing? This is like, you know, Star Trek was on TV then, the original. I'm like, it's like Star Trek. It was fantastic. It was like a pyramid of Egypt over my father's car. It was the most incongruous thing I've ever seen. Shiny silver, right? My father, Debbie, looked at it like, looking at his car like it needs to be washed, looking at his socks. No interest, wasn't afraid, wasn't enthralled, nothing. No reaction. My father had zero reaction, okay? That's the key to this whole story I'm about to tell you. I'm jumping up and down like a lunatic. After two minutes, my my dad says, come on, kid, let's go home. Get in the car, we go home. This is March 1970, rotary phone in my kitchen. (laughs) I call it the rotary phone, the Asbury Park Press newspaper. I go, hi, my name is Danny. I'm 14. I just saw a UFO with my dad, a UFO in the sky with my dad and a big silver craft. And the lady goes, Sonny, I can't talk to you now. We're getting hundreds of phone calls about this. I'm very sorry. I have to go. I remember clear as day. That's what the lady told me. She hung up on me. Um, no article ever ran in the paper. I checked the paper every day that week. Nothing ran. I forgot that story happened for 47 years. 47 years years gone completely uh, just didn't think of it i'd never talked about it with my father now at the time i was a drummer i was in rock bands i was growing my hair long i just got my drum set for my bar mitzvah uh you can see i have electronic drums behind i still play drums i've been a drummer since the age of 10. so i was into bands and, and, and rock music and rock and roll going to concerts looking at pretty girls from a distance with my friends and being too shy to talk to them, you know, all that dopey teenage stuff. So I never thought about UFOs after that day. Now we cut to April, 2017. Okay. 47 years later, my dad died in Florida with his second wife. Uh, He had a very bad Alzheimer's the last two years of his life. He didn't know who he was. He didn't know who I was, my brothers. He didn't know anything at the end. It was a very sad uh, end. Three days after my dad dies, I'm I'm here in L.A. I go go to Junior. Speaking of delis, I'm a big deli man. I went to Junior's Deli in Westwood. It's gone now. Mm -hmm. And to to get a pastrami sandwich, Debbie, I went to get a pastrami sandwich and to mourn my father. 
That's mm-hmm. why I went to this junior's deli. Mm-hmm. I sat there and everything I'm going to tell you now is real and honest and I'm not a liar. Okay. Went to the deli, ordered my pastrami sandwich. The waiter walks away. I'm sitting there thinking about my dad. A beam of energy, beam of energy from the sky. Bang into my head from above into my head like this. Bang hard and right side of my head. Bang hard. Through my eyes, through my brain, projected in the air, projected 10 inches in front of my face, is a 3D color hologram of the movie, home movie, of the 1970 UFO sighting I had with my father. It played in the deli, in the air. It played in the air. I swear on my daughter, this is a true story, okay? I'm like, holy shit. What the hell is that? I remember that day. Now, it wasn't from my point of view. It was from a point of view as though God himself had been the cameraman and was standing 10 feet away from my father's car like Cecil B. DeMille with a camera. It wasn't from my eyes. It was from, it had been recorded from a distance. I see my father's car. I see my father. I see me jumping up and down, like I said, pointing. And there's a craft in the sky. And I'm seeing this live. I'm seeing it, watching it. Three days after my father died, right? And there's audio. And I, I mean, dad, dad, look, I'm hearing that. And then my dad, here's the best part, Debbie. My dad winked at me. My dad looked down, winked at me. And then my dad said, come on, kid, let's go home. Which I had remembered that part. Okay. Then this movie faded away. It, it played for 30, 40 seconds. That's all it was. It was suspended right there. It was the most, it was like I'm looking at you. It was that crystal clear. It was like I'm looking at you right now. It went away. Now I'm shaking. I'm like, what the hell was that, right? Then a little voice, get a pen, get a pen. You ask for a pen, you need a pen, you need a pen, you need a pen. So I asked the waiter, can I have a pen? Waiter brings me a pen. On the table in the deli, on the table is a paper, white paper placemat. I put the pen in my right hand. My right hand wrote, I did not write. My right hand wrote, it's called automatic writing. My hand wrote the following. Write a book about benevolent aliens. Lead character's father knew about UFOs. And then I wrote capital A, capital T, capital C. And then my hand stopped moving. Okay. I swear to this is all true. I'm looking at the paper. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? What the hell is this? And I'm looking and looking, looking. And then I came up with ATC after they came. This book was given to me in a deli three days after my father. Now, who was my father? Best part of the whole story. My father was a electronics engineer and a physicist for the U.S. Army for 45 years. He worked for Fort Monmouth Army Base in, in Belmar, New Jersey. My father designed missiles and radar systems and mm. military drones. Mm. My father helped to invent, and he told me this, the only thing he ever told me. He goes, you know, I helped invent military drones. I'm like, Dad, that's cool. Can we get ice cream? You know, I'm 10. I don't know what the hell he's talking about. My father helped invent military drones. Nothing serious, okay? My father was a genius. He worked there for 45 years. He never told my mother or me or my brothers any details ever. Other than I helped, uh, one, the one time he said that. I used to ask him as a kid, Dad, what do you do for a living? He goes, I, I helped America win the Cold War. It's all he ever said. I helped America win the Cold War. Wow. So after he died and I got this download and then I ate my pastrami sandwich, I came home, I wrote my book. It took me eight months to write my book. As I'm writing the book, right after my dad died, I called my mother. She's still alive. She'll be 90 in October. I said, Mom, in all the years you were with Dad, did he ever talk about UFOs or aliens or anything like that? She said, in the early 50s, listen to this story, (laughs) in the early 1950s, they took your father deep into the vaults in Fort Monmouth Army Base, deep into the vaults, and they showed him something top secret. And your father came home. He was pale, shaking, and nervous. And 
I said, honey, what's wrong? And my father said to my mother, I saw something today I could never tell you about as long as I live. Hmm. And my father never did. Okay? Oh, my God. I want so, to get a medium in here <laughs> to channel your father. So, okay. Now, there's more clues coming. Hold on. There's there's more clues. Wait, there's more. Cool. Wait, there's more. So, I after he died, I started looking through old scrapbooks and, and folders I had for my dad. I found a newsletter profile of my dad at, from his workplace that I didn't know I had for 40 years. From 1985, it profiled my dad, and it basically says, my father helped invent laser-driven military drones. Okay, He was the head of that program. My father was a genius. He was. He was a genius. Okay, It said he, missiles, radars, military drones, laser. He went out to White Sands Missile Testing Range all the time to test his inventions. He went to the Pentagon all the time. He once told me he wrote wrote a paper that JFK read, which I thought was very cool. Oh. Oh, really? President? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, the president read my paper. My dad was a major person. Okay, now a couple, three more things, if I can recall all of them. Um, Richard Dolan has two books called UFOs and the National Security State. In volume one, Debbie in the back, is an index of military UFO encounters. In that in in that index in 1951, a UFO was was spotted and tracked on radar above Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. In 1952, two UFOs were tracked and on radar above Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. My dad started working there in 1951. Mm -hmm. He had to if he had if he didn't see those events with his own eyes, he had to have heard of them. He had to have. It's not credible that he didn't because he just had started there. It was his brand new workplace. He was there from 51 to 96. 51 is only four years after the Roswell crash happened, right? Okay. Now, this is a killer, this one. Last June, Dr. Stephen Greer gave a three-hour lecture in Washington at the press club. And in his talk, Debbie, if you saw it, he says, I have proof from whistleblowers that there are 145 U.S. military bases that are doing top secret and often illegal projects using reverse extraterrestrial technology. Yeah. Okay. He presented the slide on the TV. Okay. I freeze framed it. 145 U.S. military bases. Number 51 on Stephen Greer's list, number 51 was Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. Mm. Okay. So now mm. we put all of these clues together. Wow. My dad worked there for 45 years. He invented military drones. He gave talks at the Pentagon. He saw his missiles tested at White Sands. Mm. My mother said he saw something top secret. She said, your father was never the same after that day. Think about that. Your father was never the same after that day. I never heard that story, Debbie, till after my father died. My mother never told me that story as a child. Never heard it. Um, the Dolan sightings in his book, Greer, says Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, worked on reverse engineered craft. And the best part of all, my father and I saw a UFO together. He was bored and he winked at me. Now you put all those together and I've told this story all over the world for the last two years. What do you come up with? My father knew what that UFO was. He had to have known what it was. Had to have known what it was. On top of that, in my gut and heart, I believe it was a military man-made drone using extraterrestrial technology. Wow. I, had, I believe it came from Fort Monmouth. Why it hovered over my father's car. Someone, someone recently said, Dan, it's almost like your dad's friends at his workplace were playing a joke on him because right. it hovered because it hovered over my father's car. Why would it of all the places it it's like be, right on time, right on time? Yeah, yeah. Like let's let's scare Jack Harari and let's 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 he's with his son. Let's let's throw him a bone and make him it was like it was like it had been orchestrated. Unbelievable. Um, and that's so, deep. So, so when this I went, is like in your blood, really. So when I went to the deli three days after he died, right, and I had that download. I feel honest to God that my dad from heaven mm. gave me that movie. And, and here's what my dad was saying from heaven, Debbie. He was saying, Danny, 
I couldn't tell you while I was alive what I did for a living, but I'm dead now. Remember the UFO we saw together? Here it is. I'm in heaven now. I'm going to show it to you, and you're going to realize, Daddy, that I was involved with that. And I'm telling you the God's honest truth. I feel that my dad gave me that and the book. I, th I think it came from my father from heaven. I have goosebumps. That is so cool. <laughs> it's it all really real. Is it's cool. real. I know. It's a remarkable story. I know. It's it. remarkable. And also in your latest book that you don't have yet, but we're all anxious but for. But I have my... the cover. Yeah, I just have the cover. Like yeah. <laughs> my paranormal life, supernatural stories from a Hollywood insider. You describe tales of what you think or believe was a gargoyle, a creature who saved your life when you were five years old. And you also reveal that you've had contact throughout your life with ghosts, with poltergeists, with angelic, with disembodied voices. Yes. Like, yeah, that's deep stuff. So can you share if there's any experience in particular that stands out to you with all of that? Can you share a story or two about that? Sure, sure. Um, well, I'll start with my father. So after he died, I got that download three days later, right? Five days after he died, this is a great story again. Five days after my father died, I was in Silicon Valley for a business meeting. Uh, and then that night, I'm in a hotel, Silicon Valley, three in the morning, sound asleep at this hotel. And in the middle of the night, had to be three in the morning, my, the, my mattress started to uh, vibrate and rumble. Okay. I thought it was a minor earthquake. And then Debbie, I swear to you, I heard, I heard from underneath my bed, I heard Danny genie changed my will. Now that was my father's voice. Genie was his second wife. He's the only person that called her genie. Her name was Jean. Danny genie changed my will five days after my father died. He told me this in the middle of the night as a voice, not just a, did a kind of a whisper. It shook my bed, Debbie. My bed vibrated. I got out of the bed. I go, Dad? I said, Dad? Dad? I looked around the room. I looked under the bed. But maybe my dad's ghost was. Turns out my brothers and I, after that happened, we hired a lawyer in Florida. He looked, checked in with her, my father's second wife, long story short. She changed his insurance policies. She changed his will. Wow. While he had Alzheimer's. She mm. had taken, Debbie, she had taken his hand. My dad didn't know who he was. Wow. She had taken his hand and re and signed things. Papers. I saw the papers. I'm like, that's his signature. But it's like, it's like his hand was like this. Yeah. My I father know. told me from heaven that that happened. Wow. Week after that, I'm back here at home in LA. I live in Beverly Hills. I'm in my bed, middle of the night. My light in my bedroom, I have a touch lamp in my bedroom, go on and off, on and off, on and off, middle of the night. It could only go on and off if someone is touching it. Mm. Three in the morning, my light's going, I, I sat up, I go, Dad? And then it stopped. A couple days later, I think if you see behind me, there, I have a little, little blue, little drum set, little toy drum set. My dad gave me that 30 years ago as a gift. That was in my room. A couple of days after the light turned on and off, Debbie, middle of the night, three in the morning, the drums and cymbals are clanging, are clanging. I knew that was my dad because mm -hmm. he gave it to me. He got me my drums for my bar mitzvah. I knew it was him. I said, Dad, is that you again? And then my heart's, and now it's three in the morning. You don't really want to be scared by anyone, including your father. And Debbie, I said, Dad, please stop. You're scaring the shit out of me. Please stop. <laughs> and I really, and honest to God, I, I'm sorry I said that, because after that, his visits uh, stopped. Oh, but his you visit. can invite him back. You can. You can have boundaries around those. Well, he, comes, well, he comes to me in dreams. After that, it's been all, I've had countless dreams mm. of him. And That's in the best, the best one, this is a month after he died. I'm, I'm dreaming. I'm in a room with a, at a long table. I'm on one side of the table. My father's on the other side. My middle brother, Bob, is on the other side of the table. My dad was healthy and fit and had a dark black mustache, which he never had in real life. And in the dream, Debbie, I look at my father. He's right across the table. I go, Dad? He goes, yes. I go, what are you doing here? You're dead. And Debbie, in the dream, my father said, I know I'm dead. 
but I really wish I wasn't. Mm. And then I looked to my brother, Bob, on the side. We were very close. I said, Bob, in the dream, Bob, we're talking to our dead father in a dream. And my brother, Bob, said, duh, don't you think I know that? <laughs> <laughs> and there were many, many more dead dad dreams. Many. I've had more than I could remember all of them. So he's been visiting me since he passed away. Incredible. Incredible that he's still that connected with you. Yeah. That's love, I think. Absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, you also talk about in your book that you, and you mentioned this earlier, at the beginning of the interview that, yep, I've always had the ability to manifest like big stuff, people, clients, et cetera. What are some outstanding examples? Like, are there PR people that you manifested? Are there, you know, people we know or situations? I'll give you three. I'll give you three good examples. In 1980, I was commuting from the Jersey Shore into Manhattan. I was working at Columbia Pictures as a publicist, my first entertainment industry job. Mm. So I was commuting from Jersey to Manhattan. And that's a killer commute, man. That's four hours a day on a bus. And I hated every second of it. Mm -hmm. So I work at Columbia Pictures. And every day I used to go to Central Park and sit mm -hmm. on the same rock and eat, <laughs> eat lunch on my rock and just think, like, what am I doing with my life? You're like, I want to be in entertainment business, but, you know, this isn't right. I was in the promotions department. I didn't like what I was doing. Debbie said, one day when I'm sitting on the rock, I'm thinking, and I haven't, I, and I had been very unlucky with women in that period of time. I had just broken up with a girlfriend. I was very lonely. I'm sitting on the rock eating a sandwich. I'm thinking, I should write a letter to Hugh Hefner and ask him for advice, how to go about meeting women in Manhattan. Like, what would his... And, I'm, and I was writing the... I swear to you, I was writing this letter in my head every week, every time I ate on that rock. And I was there for four months. And then I left that job. But I'm like, I got to write to Hugh Hefner. I got to write him a letter. Maybe he's, he's Hugh Hefner's going to help me. Hugh Hefner's going to help me. I know it. If I write it to him, I never sent the letter. Four years later, exactly to the month, I'm working for Hugh Hefner in, in West Hollywood, in Beverly Hills. I was. I know exactly where his house was because I used to live in Westwood and West Hollywood. So I, I used to walk by there. Uh, Charing Crossroad. I was the first yep. publicist for the Playboy Channel. So oh my four God. years later, from did the you rock, tell him, did you say, dude, I, I almost mean, sent this to you. <laughs> I'll tell you at that time, I, it didn't occur to me how cool that was, but I worked for Playboy for two and a half years. I was the first publicist ever for the Playboy show. Amazing. So I manifested Hugh Hefner. Okay. That's a whole <laughs> chapter in my book. Wow. That's one example. As an adult, I've been a Hollywood publicist a really long time. I worked for a company that I hated for seven and a half years. I will not name the name of this company. I was a senior vice president there. The head guy was a prick. I hated his mm. guts. He was a prick to me. He was a prick to everyone and I hated him. But I was there a long time. I developed a following there. Uh, and I was with him from 90, 80, from 89 to 96, seven and a half years. So now uh, June, June, 1996, I'd been with this guy over seven years. He and I went to a business meeting at the Four Seasons Hotel in Beverly Hills. It's me, him, this boss that I hated, and two clients of his. And he's telling them how great he is, that they should hire him to be, to be their publicist, on and on about how, what a genius he is and how great he is. This guy, and he's none of those things, but he just was talking about how great he was. And I, here's another story, fantastic story. I had just turned 40. I just turned 40. And here's a side story. I had clinical depression from 15 to 40 undiagnosed my entire life. I had clinical undiagnosed depression. When I turned 40, I found a psychiatrist. He gave me Prozac. I became undepressed after 25 years. I, so my 40th birthday, I suddenly had become undepressed and I'm working for this prick that I didn't want to be working for. I'm sitting there, Debbie, I'm taking notes with my little suit, my little tie, taking notes at this guy who's babbling. <laughs> the chandelier, chandelier at the Four Seasons Hotel, the chandelier, it's in my book, the chandelier above my head said, Dan, mm -hmm. and I looked up, I swear to you, I'm, again, it's everything, I'm not a liar. I looked up, start your own business. I'm like, what? Oh, wow. Like this. It was like God talking to Moses. Moses, let tell the Pharaoh, let my 
Dan, I swear to you, Dan, start your, it wasn't in my ear like normal. It was from the chandelier. Dan, wow. start your own business. I'm like, okay. So I'm taking notes. I turned the page. I wish I had this piece of paper. And I wrote down all the clients that I was representing through this prick's business. And I was getting 10% of, mm. and I wrote down all my clients. And I'm like, if I got 100%, of my money instead of 10% of my money, wow. I'd be a millionaire. I wrote it down, Debbie. I looked at it. I start smiling. I stood up in the middle of the meeting. My boss goes, what's happening? I, I start laughing. I go, I have to go. <laughs> I go, I have to go in the middle of a meeting. I got up. I went home. I called all my clients. They said, Dan, we would follow you to Botswana. Mm. Three months later, I had a half a million dollar a year business from the from the chandelier at the I swear to you, I every client I it was beyond my wildest dreams. My accountant said I never saw anything like it from zero. Never saw anything like it in my life. Has anybody ever told you that you're Claire Audient? Um, no, but yes, I am. I believe that. I can I tell you too. I can tell you more. I could tell you more examples if you want more examples. That's incredible. And and There's lots, and, lots more examples. I and so you still do this. You're still wheeling and dealing in this and you have, you know, amazing clients. And at the same time, you've got this. It is kind of interesting. Like I relate a little bit. Um, well, 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 Debbie, time, well, well, I'm a, okay. So I'm a Gemini, right? I'm a Gemini. Uh -huh. I'm, a, I'm a hardcore Gemini. You know, <laughs> I am so Gemini. You know, I had a girlfriend, you know, I love, I love good Danny. I hate, I hate dark Danny. <laughs> So, so, you know, I have two, That's there's so two funny. parts of me. If there's ever two parts of a person. Now, let me tell you why. My dad was a genius engineer and a physicist. We covered that. My mother was a writer, director, actress, singer, mm. pr producer, playwright, musician, artist, poet. Okay. She's still alive. I got hardcore creativity from my mother. Yeah. I got linear, practical, A mm. plus B equals C. Two plus two equals four. Always be on time. Wow. I got so much from my dad. I got the best. That they were both lunatics also because they were both geniuses and they're both insane. But I got the best of them. I am a creature of my parents. Wow. And I'm, and I'm a Gemini. So I have, <laughs> you know, and then I have the Hollywood career and I have my paranormal career. And I've had these concurrent tracks under these trains my whole entire life. Let me tell you the gargoyle. Do we have time? Yeah. One more. Okay. <clears throat> This story I've remembered my entire life, but until I sat down to, wrote my, to write my new book, I didn't really bring it to the forefront of my brain, but I knew it was there. When I was five, 1961, I, there were two little girls that lived across the street from my parents' house, and Kathy and Lizzie, and they used to ring my doorbell, and can Danny come out to place? The three of us used to climb, vividly remember we used to climb trees and we used to climb fences we just climbed things what do you do when you're five with two little girls you climb things okay so one day <clears throat> a block from my parents house was a drugstore and in the parking lot of the drugstore was a 30 foot tall billboard sign big you know wrecks all drugs big sign i remember it clearly these girls go let's go climb inside the sign i'm like okay so I followed them down the street. We went inside the wooden skeleton lattice inside the billboard, not the external sign part, you know, the, the skeleton inside. It was wood, wooden panels. And we're climbing up, and it's just 30, this is a 30 foot sign. We're climbing up inside. Me and these two girls were climbing up. Debit clears that, I remember climbing, climbing, climbing. My hands slipped from a beam that I remember I had a beam, I slipped. I looked at these girls, they were like horrified. And in slow motion, I fell backwards on my back. So I'm looking up at the sky and I'm falling in slow motion through the sky thinking, what's happening to me? And the two little girls were like, like this, okay? So I'm falling, falling, falling. The next thing that I remember clearly, I woke up on a couch in a house a block away from the sign. No one was home. No one was there. I'm in a strange house on a couch. No one's there. I call, I sat up, I came to, I said, hello, hello, is anyone here? Is anybody here? No one was there. 
I stood up. I didn't know where I was. It was a strange house. I, I stood up to leave. And here's the best part of the story. At the front door, Debbie, was a seven-foot-tall creature, creature, Chalk, white chocolate color, like off white, so white chocolate color. He looked like he had had. He was. A, it was a creature. It wasn't a man. It looked like he had had wings that had been cut off with hedge clippers. So they're like bony. There were bony stumps on his where wings would have been. There were bony stumps right here. He had the face of a bull, a bull. And I turned to to go to the door, and he turned. And he went like that. He looked behind me. Went. He snorted at me, and I looked at him. He snorted at me. I got the impression of, yeah, I saved your life, you little bastard, but I didn't want to. <laughs> then he either walked through the door or just dissipated and, and was gone. So I then walked out the door. I'm on the sidewalk. I'm looking around. I'm like, oh, mommy's house is this way. Six houses to the left is mommy's house. So I walked home. That's the whole story. Now I've every so often it's like oh yeah I fell off the sign yeah I fell off the yeah there's a creature so when I wrote the book I wrote it down I told my mother you dreamed the whole thing it didn't happen I go mom I'm telling you the truth now it was a dream why didn't you tell me when it I go mom I was five I'm gonna tell you you know mom I was climbing a billboard sign and I think I died and a, and a gar you know gargoyle saved me and it had no wings and yeah it was a gargoyle. I'm, I'm going to tell her when I'm five. Mom, Ma, can I have oatmeal? Like, right, I'm five years old. That's my first story in my whole book. It's just called The Gargoyle. It's my first, it's my first job. Wow, incredible stuff. I got to say, like, you're the kind of guy, <laughs> pe people out there who test people, people out there who channel things and can tell you what these, I feel like their abilities but I also feel like you have some contact in and out of this reality with other be beings from other dimensions, galaxies, parallel lives, et cetera. Yes. I, I believe everything you're saying, and it would be amazing for you to participate in something like that to find out more facts behind the scenes. Because, wow, what a life you've led. And um, I can't wait to see you at contact. <laughs> in the desert for folks who are interested contact in the desert taking place in California, Indian Wells. It's May 30th to June 3rd. Right. And I'm going to end with this Dan Harari. This is dare to dream. What are you next dare to dream? What are your future dreams and goals? Oh, what a great question. Um, well, I hope Contact in the Desert goes well. I am deeply involved there. I have a, I have a lot to do there. Um, I'm helping my daughter get a new apartment because she had a problem with her apartment. I'd like to live long enough to see my daughter get married to a nice guy and not a schmuck or a putz because her boyfriends tend to be schmucks and putzes. I would say my biggest dream honestly, in my life is to walk my daughter down the aisle. Um, my mother turns 90 in October. God bless her. I hope she lives to, to be 110. Um, I have another book coming out, uh, Debbie, called Five. On June 10th, I have a nonfiction, I'm sorry, a fiction, dark fiction book called Five. It's my fifth book. It's about a serial killer who gets reincarnated throughout time. And I tapped into some of that because I have a feeling that I might have been, I've been told I was a serial killer in the 1870s. So that's a whole, and we could do another show if you want to do that. My serial killer, past life, that's a whole nother show. Um <laughs> I just want to say the amazing thing about that is for anybody who's watching and listening, like don't judge because I have been told that we have been everything. We have been persecuted. We've been the persecutor. We've been the victor. We've been the victims. We have been, I had, you know, the, I'm into shamanism and I had this very famous shaman on the show who practices in Peru, um, the Inca way, but he's also very famous worldwide. And he was saying as he was growing up, his grandfather was his tutor and he had so much anger towards the conquistadors for what they had done to his people. Wow. And it was interfering. And his grandfather said, his name is Puma Freddy. And he said, come with me, Puma. I want to show you something. And he took Puma on a journey. And of course, these shamans are phenomenal. They literally leave this realm and go into others. And in this case, Puma Freddy and his grandfather went back in time 
and Puma saw himself as a Spanish conquistador. So it ameliorated everything. It took care of that rage he felt. He felt tremendous compassion for his people, for the Spanish. So truly we have been all things in all times and concurrently. Have you ever heard of, that's very interesting. Years ago, I saw Amanda Folger, who was a shaman in Malibu, and Aaron Kirk, who was a shaman in Beverly Hills. And they both gave me readings and very interesting things were said to me. But uh, if you know anybody who wants to study me or you or you want to study me or do something, I'm very game because I've been living with these things for six. I'll be 68 in two weeks. And uh, my whole life, I you know, I hear voices and I have dreams and things that come true. Uh, wait, wait. Someday I'll tell you my first girlfriend and my and my wife and how those two people were almost the same person. Uh, unbelievable. I have just stories upon stories. There's no end. I don't know why. I really don't know why. I think well, seed maybe- planted. I mean, I will really because I, I do meet extraordinary people when I you know do stage stuff because yeah. I speak about these things. I speak about shamanism and extraterrestrials and also, you know, because the people come on the show. But this is super fascinating. So tell me, what do you dare to dream? Because you've created a lot. What is next for you? OK, I know how to answer you. As we speak, a screenwriter in New York City is writing a screenplay for my book after they came. So he's writing a screenplay. I'm going to pitch it to the Hollywood producers who I know that are in my alliance. My dare to dream would be that my mother lives long enough to see after they came on a big screen as a movie. Okay, that's my that would be my dream in life. Because yeah. my, my mother sent me to Boston University. She said, Danny, you're a writer. You're a writer. You're a writer. You're my whole life. You're a writer. You're a writer. I finally became a writer at 65. And uh, yeah, that would be my dream. My mother lives to see that day because I think she would just at the end of her life, she'd say, I knew it. I knew it was going to happen. Mazel tov. Thank you. That's very sweet. And I, I never thought of that before, but that really, that would be my dream. After the day after my daughter gets married. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was, that's my double. Right. All right. You get Thank to you have so all of it. Yeah, it's a oh, pleasure. So pleasure. folks who would like to find him, go to danhariauthor.com. It's right. H-A-R-A-R-Y author.com. And I end today's show with this quote from Russell Kemp. Wonderful, wonderful, fortunate you. This is the year that your dreams come true. This is the year that your ships come in. This is the year you find love within. This is the year you feel glad to live. This is the year you have much to give. This is the year when you know the truth. This is the year when you find new youth. This is the year that brings happiness. This is the year you will live to bless. Wonderful, wonderful, fortunate you. This is the year when your dreams come true. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. Leave a comment and share. And if you are listening to the podcast and would like to join us on YouTube, go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. Next week on the show will be Geraldine Orozco, a clinical hypnotherapist, epigenetic psychotherapist, and meditation instructor who shares her information of interdimensional human genetic timelines and advanced healing and activation of human DNA. She's been featured on Unidentified with Demi Lovato, Gaia TV, and Travel Channel's UFO Witness. I'm looking forward to that. And again, folks, if you would like to become a writer and write a book, write many books like Dan did, like I have. Join me for this five-day challenge where I'll be working with you live, debbyd.net slash book challenge. That's D-E-B-B-I D.net slash book challenge. Thanks for joining us today on Dare to Dream.